Hi, everyone. I'm presenting to you today a friend and, and colleague and a leader in the community, Ginny Gilder. And of the many things that she's done, she's a business leader in the community, she's a philanthropist in the community, and she's also one of the owners of the Seattle Storm. And I, I invited Jenny, was really fortunate that she said yes, because the Storm won a WNBA championship. This is the only NBA team that we have in, in Seattle, and they won a championship in, in 2020, which is a really good news item in, in Seattle. She does remarkable work, and I hope you enjoy her story. So my question for you to think about, there are several distinct things that Jenny talks about. One, when she was a student at Yale, her activism at Yale as, as a member of the crew team, there's that part. And then in the 1980s, her Olympic participation and lack of participation because we boycotted the Olympics in 1980 and she wins say silver medal in 1984. So there's that part. And then in 2020, they win the national championship or they win the WNBA championship. Which of those things do you think is most impactful to you? Is it her college experience? Is it her Olympic experience? Or perhaps the, the role of the storm in 2020? What do you believe is most impactful for you in your mind? of her story. So listen to her story and just reflect back. What do you think is most impactful of what you've heard? So thank you. We're getting near the end of the quarter and I hope we're all keeping well. Take good care. Hi, everybody. What a pleasure for me to, to have a moment with, with my friend and, and colleague and really a leader in the, in the community, what, uh, someone I consider a servant leader in the community, Jenny Gilded. Jenny, thanks for, for finding time to join the, the class. Oh, Ed, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to get to be here and talk with you for all your students. I thought about a couple of you for a couple of reasons. One, because you're an alum of the University of Washington. You got a, a degree in our business school here. So, so there's that. And also in 2020, the storm won a WNBA championship. And that was a really huge part of 2020. But before I talk about the storm and the championship and the ownership team, um, I want to talk about you a bit because our students need to know a little bit about who you are. And so let me, my first question. So I want to go back to 1972, Title IX has passed. And there's a, it's part of an educational amendment that protects people from discrimination based on sex in ed programs. And so 1972, Title IX has passed. You come to school, you come to college at, at Yale in 1976. And you were recruited to row? Were you recruited for rowing? No, I came to, I actually started as a freshman in the fall of 1975, and I was a complete and total walk-on. Um, rowing, women's rowing was barely around. It, the Montreal Olympics were gonna be in 1976, and the Canadians added women's rowing, and that was really when the sport started to grow. Um, but. I was kind of an asthmatic, a little bit of a couch potato in high school. So you didn't row in high school? No. But you started in, you started in college. How did you find rowing? Um, I saw the head of the Charles, this amazing regatta, when I was in boarding school in Boston. So that was the fall of 1974 and just thought it looked beautiful. I didn't see any women on the course that day, didn't think about that, just thought I want to try that if I have a chance. And so when I got into college, my dad actually said to me, um, my birthday's in June. He said, after I got into college, he said, what do you want for your birthday? I was like, I don't know. He said, how about a pair of rowing shoes? That was how little we knew about the sport because rowing shoes are actually built into rowing shells. So he knew I wanted to row, but we knew nothing about it. And when I started, the coach wasn't very interested in me because I was short. Interesting. So. Interesting. So then you, you, you try out for the team and you make the team. Yeah. Talk about some of the dynamics that were going on in 1976, because your team does something really significant and important that has relevance to Title IX. So talk about the context of the women's team that you join as a freshman right. and the men's team. What's going on there? So in 1975, the um, novice novice all novice men and women rowers uh not just the novices but the varsity rode in this place uh about a mile away from campus in the fall and then in this winter you would get to start rowing at the boathouse which was 12 miles away 
the, my first experience with off water training was that winter and New Haven, unlike Seattle, um, is really cold in the winter and all the water would freeze. So rowing is a full year sport. We would go indoors and do these horrible workouts indoors, weights, running stairs. I mean, it was brutal. And we would use the weight room that the men used. So we got a lot of flack for using the men's space. That wasn't very fun. I'd never been called names before or really discriminated in any way against you know i you know just for the for your students i grew up in new york city as an upper east side girl white private school you know total privilege privilege really wasn't a word back then the way it is now so i didn't even realize i was privileged but running into bias for the first time in my life other than my father giving me a hard time for not knowing how to throw uh, was really uh, an eye-opening experience. But it, it actually got worse because when we went to the boathouse to start rowing, we discovered that there were no locker rooms, showers for the women. And in fact, there was this one tiny bathroom in the back of the boathouse where the, which the women could use. So what that meant was every day after practice, we would take the same bus as the men. We would get on the bus wet and sweaty from having done our workout and we would have to wait for 25 minutes for the guys to take their showers. And then we would have to drive home another 25 minutes because it was 12 miles from campus. And then we had to eat dinner because the dining hall was gonna close. So that was the situation. And we had a very feisty captain named Chris Ernst. Uh, you can check out the documentary, A Hero for Daisy, um, if you wanna know about her. And she got really fed up she and another teammate, Ann Warner, were training for the 1976 Olympics. And as soon as we started rowing in the water, on the water that February, everybody started getting sick. So she devised a protest. And the protest basically consisted of all the women on the crew um, meeting in the basement where our locker room was in the gym, writing Title IX in Yale blue ink on our backs putting on our very fancy cotton sweatpants and sweatshirts and going over to the athletic administration offices where Chris had made an appointment with the head of women's athletics, a woman named Joni Barnett. So let me and get this straight. So Joni Barnett is the head of athletics and she expects to have an appointment with a member of the crew team. And, and what does she get in, in return? Yes, she gets 19 women. She gets a stringer for the New York Times and she gets a photographer from the Yale Daily News. So all women except for, I think the stringer was a guy. And she obviously figured out that this was a momentous moment. We all trooped into her office and she actually stood up at her desk. So she didn't sit there and receive us. She stood up, which I view as kind of a sign of respect in retrospect. And Chris had written this very formal statement and we were all standing facing Joni Barnett and Chris gave a signal. And Chris, along with the rest of us, we took off our clothes. We took off our sweatpants and our shirts and we were completely naked. And then she stood and faced Joni. So tits forward, pardon the expression. And we turned around so Joni could see the Title IX on our backs. And then Chris read this statement. We turned around, we put our clothes back on and we left. And that was it. And then things started happening the next day, starting with the athletic director calling our coach, who was a guy, both were guys, and yelling at our coach, saying, why can't you control your women? But then what happened was, um, not only was there an article in the Yale Daily News, but there was an article on the first page of the second section of the New York Times. And then it got picked up by the uh, AP wire services, it hit the International Herald Tribune. And in 1976, that was as close as you got to going viral. And by the end of the week, there were Yale alums, all men, because Yale had only been co-ed, like think about five years at that point. Alums were calling and writing the president of the university saying things like, why did you ever let women into Yale to get those girls a shower. And then they built an addition to the boathouse the next year. So had impact went, went viral 
did you understand the the breadth of the impact and the depth of the impact that you were having? You're still a freshman at this point. Absolutely not. No way. I didn't know that athletic directors around the country were calling their coaches saying, are our athletes going to do this? I didn't understand how hard it is to make a university move. Um, and I didn't understand the power of anger and the power of youth and the, the, um, the value of impatience with the status quo. I'm going to come back to that power of, of young people and um, impatience with the status quo, because this ends up being kind of a theme that runs through, through your life and your, and your work, does it not? Yeah, in some ways. And it is interesting because now that I'm not young and I don't have the power of youth, I have a different kind of power. So we can talk about that later too. Okay, so you got pretty good. So you started rowing and you got pretty good at it by the time you were finished. Um, and that was just through sheer will. How did you become really one of the nation's elite athletes in four years? I think, honestly, I really needed to row. It was a great outlet. I, I had a lot of anger, um, right, really because of my own growing up story in terms of my family's dysfunction. And it gave me a great outlet. And I felt like I had a lot to prove. And rowing gave me a venue for trying to prove myself. In, in the late 1970s and in the early 80s, for some of us growing up, the Olympics, the Olympics were it. There weren't a lot of sports on television. Um, there wasn't a lot of coverage of, of um, professional sports or college sports. So the Olympics were it. And I remember getting to that point of um, the Olympic Games in 1980 and, and just getting excited about it. And then we boycott. And you were, you were slated to win as part of your um, four person wrote team to win the gold medal that, that year. And we boycott. I'll talk about what was happening in the country and what that felt like to be prepared to win the gold medal and to have the United States boycott. Jimmy Carter was the president at the time, I believe. Right. Jimmy Carter was president. Mind you, for me personally, it was a very, it was a culmination of four, five years of training. And I had started trying out for national teams in 1977. So I got cut three years in a row. By 1980, I was graduated and my father was really tapping his fingers on the table going, I paid for your very fancy education. It's time for you to get a job. And what are you doing? And so I basically lied and said I wasn't going to try out, but I couldn't stop myself. Because the other thing is, is I really loved rowing. So for me, my goal was to make the team, just make the team. And then that we were considered you know, favorites to do well was kind of an added benefit. But what happened was um, Jimmy Carter during his administration really ha had this commitment. He did not want any American soldiers to die while he was president. And that was a pledge he had made. And in the fall of 1979, late fall of 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. So Jimmy Carter tried to use a different kind of diplomacy, I guess you could say, to get the Soviets to reverse course. And the 1980 Olympics were to be held in Moscow. The Soviets care, just like any country cares about their image. And when you get to be a host of something about like the Olympics, it's a really big deal. So Jimmy Carter thought if he hit them there where it would hurt their image and their chance to host the world, maybe they would pull back. So he told the Soviets publicly that if they did not withdraw from Afghanistan, Afghanistan by uh, February 15th of 1980, the United States would boycott the Olympics. And, and this is the first time that I recall in our history that we used athletics and sports in a political venue that way. In, in such a powerful way. It may not have been the first time, but it was the first time the Olympics had been used that way, at least in the United States that I recall. Right. It, there were uh, smaller countries that had boycotted for various reasons, but certainly not the U.S. And not just the U.S., but the U.S., they have forced their allies to um, join them. So many, many countries made the decision to boycott. It wasn't just the United States at the end by any means. So there's no question that Carter, you know, did what he wanted. 
Um, he succeeded there, but the Soviets did not exit Afghanistan. And the, one of the most interesting things to me about it is the American public totally backed Jimmy Carter which was not something that I really remember until I was researching it. And on, in February of 1980, that was when the dream team, the US hockey team won the gold medal. So the US went from being wildly excited about winning hockey and then going, yep, forget the summer Olympics. We don't care. It was amazing. What was that like for you personally? And how did you learn that you weren't gonna row? How did you learn that? And what was it like for you? Well, I was running stairs the day that the boycott became official. I remember I turned to my, you know, I was running with a woman named Sally, Sally Fisher. We were both training for the Olympics. We hadn't made the team. They didn't choose the team for another three months. I said, like, why are we doing this? And she looked at me and said, I don't know, but we got another set and she started running. So. Uh, the Olympic team, the U.S. Olympic team, uh, committee decided they were going to name a team for every sport. So I decided to keep, keep training. And then even in my family, my stepmother and father were just very pra pragmatic about the whole thing. Like, of course you're boycotting. What's the big deal? That's what's right for the country. And I, of course, um, felt differently. I was really unhappy that I was having to give this up. And there's a woman named Anita de France, who is, was, is now a US member of the International Olympic Committee, who really led the fight among the athletes to, to get Carter to overturn the boycott decision. And so the, as a rower, it meant that, you know, she was, it meant that rowers were at the center of the attempt to get Carter to change his mind. So right away, you know, I was learning, you know, my experience as a freshman at Yale. Now here I am graduated. Politics and sports go together. And of course it all failed. But, you know, for me at the end of the day, I wanted to make the team. I had never made the team. I ended up making the team. So for me personally, that was a huge accomplishment. And I ended up contextualizing this experience as, you know, there's so many people in our country who make sacrifices for freedom. And it sounds really corny, but you know, I never went to war. No one in my family fought in the military. No one died for this country. I kind of felt like as unfair as it was, I, you know, I feel privileged to be an American, despite the fact that we certainly 2020 has shown us if we didn't, if we needed any more evidence, this is not a perfect union. Um, and if this was my part, that was my part. So, you know, a lot of mixed feelings. And ultimately, the truth is there's a lot in life that you don't control. And what are you going to focus on? So this is part of service to your country. And you continue to row, you continue to compete. You continue to get better. And in 1984, you go back to Olympics again as part of a quadruple skulls team. And what happened there? Well, just to give your students a little more color, because it's so much fun. Ten days before the Olympic trials for the single, I was supposed to win the singles trials. I broke my rib over training. So I ended up in the quad. Um, so I was lucky to make the team again because I had ignored my training regimen and just done what I wanted um, and did too much. So making the team and walking into the stadium in Los Angeles, because the 84 Olympics were at home. And by the way, the Soviet Union and most of the Eastern Bloc boycotted that Olympics to pay back the US for what we had done in 80. But it really didn't matter. Walking into the uh, the LA Coliseum and, you know, I don't know, 60, 65,000 people screaming. It was one of those unforgettable life moments. Like, oh, wow, <laughs> we're here. And um, there's not a lot of I at that moment. It was more just getting to be part of something that was so big and so magnificent. I mean, the Olympics really are about the supremacy of the human spirit. And to get to be part of that was just incredible. And you came home, you were home, but you, you brought us a silver medal back. Um, where do you keep yeah. your medal, by the, where do you keep your medal, by the way? Uh, um, well, it used to be in a plastic bag from the 84 Olympics, but the bag wore out. So I think it's somewhere in my office. 
Okay, good, good. Maybe, yeah. in, a, maybe in a sock. I think I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, this is an amazing story, Jenny, because so you go from 1976, where you weren't an athlete and you start growing, and by 1984, you're one of the elite athletes in, in the world. And athletics wasn't necessarily in your background. I'm jumping ahead to, to 2007. And you and I knew each other then. We're at the front end of a recession. And a recession that was impacting Seattle greatly, our, our city tremendously, such that not directly related to the recession, but the Seattle Sonics, the beloved Sonics, were, were sold. They left and went to where? Went to, well, I forgot. Oklahoma where. City. Oklahoma City. They went to Oklahoma City. And people were just distraught. So we lose a professional basketball team. We don't invest in a new arena. And professional basketball team. What's that? A men's professional basketball team. Yes, we lose a men's professional basketball team. Thank you. Um, and you and, and a collection of women decide to purchase a WNBA team at a time when um, nobody was thinking about buying professional teams and you purchase the, the Seattle Storm. And, and tell us about what made, what, what drove that decision for you to purchase a, a WNBA team? and keep professional so, basketball in, in Seattle. So the storm was owned by the same guy who owned the Sonics. And we knew, this group of women knew that there was no way some of our star players would agree to move to Oklahoma City. So if we, and play, so we kind of figured if that that guy, that, that, that ownership group, they didn't care about the women's team. They that wanted guy, the who's that, who's that guy you're referring to? That was Clay Bennett. Okay. Clay Bennett. So we figured maybe we could peel off the storm. We couldn't save the Sonics, of course, but maybe we could peel off the storm. So um, there was three women who ended up uh, getting together to buy the team. And then we brought on a fourth, Ann Levinson, who really did the negotiations with Clay to make the whole deal happen. But for me personally, you know, I, um, I don't know how to play basketball. And in fact, my wife gave me basketball for dummies right as this deal started going down. I didn't even know what a point guard was. I'm not kidding. I knew nothing. But coming into 2007, I had my life had changed in some significant ways for me personally. I had, I had started working with my family uh, in the investment business. I was traveling a lot. So I wasn't in Seattle as much as I had been. I had given up being on uh, the board of a local school. So I felt a little disconnected from the community. I was working in the investment business, which was incredibly male dominated. And I, um, I remember kind of thinking, I'm not really big on New Year's resolutions, but coming into the year, I was thinking, I need to get reconnected to my community. And is there anywhere that I can find to work with women again, like in some way? So that was in the back of my mind. And then this whole thing with the Sonics went down. And one of the women who I had been on the board of this private school with, I knew was a rabid Storm fan. And one of the early games in June of 2007, right after the legislature had said, we're not building an arena for the Sonics and Storm, I saw her and I got her to come talk to me in one of the halls, you know, you know right outside where all the, you know, where the arena is. And I asked her, I said, are you going to do anything, you know, to try to buy the storm or try to keep them here? And she said, well, I'm thinking about it. And, and this woman's name is Dawn Trudeau. She's one of my two partners today. And she had been part of the group, really the leader in bringing the ABL team uh, in the late 90s, the Seattle Reign to Seattle. And that hadn't worked. That, that league had folded. So I said to her, and I really, I think just again, motivated by what I just said, you know, my sense of disconnection from the community. And I also was making some money for the first time because I was in the investment business. I said, well, if you need any help, let me know. And a couple of weeks later, she called and said, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it with a small group and do you wanna join? And, and I think when I think back on it, all of that personal stuff was true. But the other thing that's true is, I didn't know how to put it into words then, but the, 
WNBA and the storm specifically live at the intersection of business, sports, and social change. And I had learned at age 17 what it means to be denied access to opportunity, not because of my religion, not because of my race, just because I was female, but that was enough. To, to ground me in what it's like to be excluded. And that experience had set me on this road of kind of a lifelong road of how do you generate access to opportunity? And I just thought, hey, I love sports. Why should women not get to pursue the, their love of sport professionally the same way guys do? So it was actually ended up being a pretty natural fit as I look back. And we didn't think about the recession at all. By the way, we should have, we didn't. This was, um, it was a business decision. We, we got the financials from the Sonics for the Storm team, but it's a very different business running an independently owned team than a team that's part of an NBA franchise. So the numbers ended up meaning nothing and we had to figure out the business and we did. So 2020, Jenny, was significant for a number of things. There were some, some, a few highlights, and there were some real lowlights during the course of this this year. Um, a couple of them, March 13th, 2020, Breonna Taylor was shot in her, Unibel, in her Louisville, Kentucky apartment. May 25th in Minneapolis, George Floyd was killed under, under, under an officer's knee. And those moved the nation, they also moved the storm. In 2020, the storm wins their fourth championship. And it's been said that in winning that championship, your team is a model for sustained and creative political engagement for honoring Breonna Taylor and dedicating every game to the Say Her Name campaign for justice for Taylor and others who experience police violence during the course of this year. And this was not just a moment in time for the storm. The storm and the ownership, the team and the ownership, the entire organization had been prepared for this moment to take a stand, to take a social stand. Talk about how you prepared yourself and what the team did this year. I think that like anything, uh, you don't make a decision based on one data point. I think the storm as an as a organization has been moving towards this for a long time, along as the culture has shifted and the players have done the same thing. Back in 2014, the WNBA as a league hosted its first Pride games across the entire league. But the storm had been having pride long before that. In 2015, the storm really made its first, as an ownership group, made its first public, I wouldn't call it quite a splash, maybe more like a pebble in the water. Uh, when then Jim Dolan owned the New York Liberty, wanted to bring in Isaiah Thomas as an owner, as a part owner of the Liberty. And Isaiah had a history of sexual harassment that had never been fully prosecuted. And we took a public stand and opposed that. And in fact, Isaiah Thomas did not become an owner of the Liberty. In 2016 was the first time that you had a WNBA team, starting with the Minnesota Lynx, uh, do a protest before a game for Black Lives Matter. The storm followed up very quickly after that. The league actually fined the players. We wrote the president of the league and said, horrible mistake. We do not support your fining the players. The fines got rescinded. And at that point, we just, we, you know, we, we had recognized how important it was to support our players that you know, the league would not exist without the players and the players were just taking the demand for social change, which we already live as uh, WNBA players and franchises one step further uh, going to the whole issue of race and inequity along that dimension. So then 2017, you have a new president, you have a very repressive organization uh, kind of move in the country against immigrants, uh, women's issues, you know, a lot of stuff. And we decided to use our platform to hold a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood. That was the first time that any kind of professional sports franchise did something that, that, was, that was that politically overt. So we kind of were building to 2020. It's just become, I think it was always part of our DNA, but it's become it's like when your hair goes gray, suddenly it becomes a little more noticeable. So 
We, you know, since 2016, our players were becoming more mature, more willing to show their impatience as young people. And we were starting to bring the wisdom, if you would, um, of our advancing age to the party. And together, our franchise has kind of taken a leadership role in wearing our beliefs a little more on our sleeve. And that culminated not just with the storm, but the entire league um, dedicating itself to Brianna Taylor in 2020. And then I, you know, if you ever want to really listen to something very moving was one of our players, Alicia Clark, at the end of game three, when we swept the um, Vegas dedicating the season to black girls and boys everywhere. And it was incredibly moving. Um, and then of course, the last thing that the storm ownership group did in 2020, like two and a half weeks after the, after the championship was we were, became the first professional sports franchise to endorse a presidential candidate when we publicly went out for Biden Harris. I recall so, that you, did you decide that as an as an ownership and as a team to to nope. support a presidential candidate? How did that happen? That was an owner decision. Um, we and we totally respect the rights of every employee, including our players, not to um, agree with us and to maintain their own opinions. But as an ownership group, we decided that's what our organization was going to do. So. You, this is going to change professional sports franchises, not just not just women's, but but men's as well, because this is really unique and distinct for for your ownership and your team to do this. I think that in the last four years, so many Americans have wanted to support businesses and organizations that um, mirror their own personal values. That's happening more and more across the country. And I think that that's legit. Um, we as owners wanted our organization to reflect our values. So that's why we've been stepping out more, especially at a time when we felt it was so important to stand up and be heard. I, I think that, you know, men, you know, certainly male Caucasian athletes haven't really had to view politics and sports as being combined because they pretty much had the run of the land, right? They've been able to do what they want, earn what they want. It's been a pretty good deal, but that's not true for the rest of us. And so politics belongs in sport, just the way it belongs in education, just like it belongs in every part of life where the government has some has its thumb on the scale in some way, or there is a broader cultural dialogue. That's what, that's where everyone belongs. So I think this is only gonna continue. And not only that, and this goes back to something I said earlier, young people bring an impatience with the status quo, which sometimes is really needed to force the issue. You get old, you get a little comfortable with how the world is. You also have, or I, I have a lot of relationships now that I didn't have when I was younger. So when I think about like doing something that someone could perceive as a threat, I think about, well, how is that going to damage that relationship? Now, sometimes that's valuable and sometimes it's the wrong way to look at things. And young people just don't have that level of concern. They're concerned with, I don't like what's happening. It's not okay. So I tend to think of the WNBA and the storm as a place where you can bring that impatience of youth with the wisdom of older people who are in their 50s and 60s. And actually there's something good about being older. Um, and together you can forge a way forward. So I love the, the, um, the power that comes with being younger and being angry. And I love being able to use that and offer my opinion and perspective to our players sometimes if they wanna talk about it as to how they might think about doing things. And I also like it because they fuel me to, to take some more risks that I might not take um, without having the benefit of what they have to say. You bought a team and you've won your fourth championship. And so on behalf of the class and the community, congratulations on the fourth championship and on winning this in, in 2020, which we much needed. But more than the, the win itself, 
um, thank you on behalf of this class and and your ownership team and the team for taking such an important stand and and being so courageous in a moment when um, when we needed you to be courageous. So thank you for that. Now speaking of courage, um, and my last couple of questions, you you you've not considered yourself a writer, but it takes an awful lot of courage to write a memoir and put that out in the world and in your book, course correction. I'm going to ask and invite our students to read it. Um, it's described as wild meets boys in the boat, a memoir about the quest for Olympic gold and the triumph of love over fear. What inspired you to write that book and, and what do you want, what impact do you want that book to have beyond you? So um, I viewed writing, I love writing and I viewed writing that book as an intellectual challenge that um, I wanted to tackle. Like it was hard, really hard. And I wanted to write something that I would be proud of and that maybe my father would be proud of. And as it turned out, he was okay with it. So that was a good thing and I hit that. So it was a very, um, on that level, it was very personal. And then on the other side was, who did I wanna talk to? Um, I, I really felt like if I could help one person see that regardless of the obstacles they have in their life, regardless of their own internal um, chaos, because I had a lot of fear um, governing me when I was younger, really for many years, that you can kind of put a stake in the ground for yourself and go for it. Um, and you know, so many people told me when I was younger what I couldn't do, what I should do. And what I learned was actually no one can tell me what I can do, what I should do. That's all for me to decide. And if I could get that message out in some small way to just a few people, it would be worth doing. So that was why I did it. And we'll look forward to the next book. <laughs> and that's a whole other conversation, but there'll be another one and I'm looking forward to it. Um, Jenny, my final question to you is, is as you reflect on 2020, has it changed you in any way? And if so, how? Yeah, I, I think for many of us who are uh, used to being able to kind of do what we want when we want, um, not being able to see people um, or fly around or sit down with my business cohorts, you know, in the same room, uh, it's been painful. Um, but it's also brought some amazing lessons. So for me, the top lesson is just slow down. I mean, I spent my whole adult life trying to do 20 things at once, you know, maybe getting a lot done, but um, I, I, I've flown, I think twice this year. Um, and what I've realized is there's not a lot of problem with staying close to home and how important it is to just um, take in the pleasures of the moment. And that includes being outside, you know, frankly, and not just rushing down the street all the time, but looking at the sky and, oh my gosh, the moon is rising, things like that, that, you know, we are of the earth and us, you know, we humans often try to elevate ourselves. Like we're so much better than everything else. Well, I'm not sure that's true. Um, and the, you know, the other thing I've learned is, or been reminded of is how important it is to be with the people who I care about most. And that's not just family and friends. That's also my, my business partners. That's my storm group. That's my investment team. You know, there's, there's a lot of communities I'm part of. It's not just five people. So how do you um, really value and honor those relationships? And the last thing I would say is, this is a big reminder that there's a lot in life that's out of your control. And you're, you know, you can focus on that if you want. You can make yourself miserable. You can whine, you can complain about all the loss. And there, are, and I'm not talking even about small loss. It's true. It's all true. People have lost their livelihoods, their businesses. They've lost family members and friends. We have over 250,000 people dead from COVID. And yet, you do have some choice over how you're going to look at your life and the future. And to the extent that you can um, manage your mourning and your grief and also generate some sense of what's possible for yourself and the world is the extent to which you are going to have probably a better life. 
I will say that the city of Seattle and the state of Washington is, is better because you're here, because of the way that you lead, because of the way that you coach, the way that you engage, and the courage that you've shown, and the way that you write, and for just being Jenny Gilder. Thanks for joining our course, and, and thanks for what you've done for 2020. You've been a sign of absolute hope for us, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Ed. Always great to be with you.